Well, good morning, Grace Fishers. It's good to be together. I'm going to invite you to stand as we worship our Lord and Savior. We have the joy of the Lord in this place. Let's sing together. One doorway that leads to life One redemption, one confession I believe in the name of Jesus Christ I believe in the crucifixion By his blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection Hallelujah, 
his life is death's defeat. All oh, praise to God the Father, all oh, praise to Christ the Son, all oh, praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. imagine, ears have heard, or eyes have seen. I believe that a day is coming, he's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning, see the Lamb who rose a roaring lion. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son. the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name I believe. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son. To the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe. Sing those words again, no, I'll never. And no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? And no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life. Amen. Amen. The gospel of Jesus, the good news, the grace that is overflowing from Christ our Savior. It's the hope that we have, the hope that we cling to, the hope in every single season of our lives. 
And I want to read a passage of scripture for us this morning, a passage that reminds us of that hope that we have in our Savior. All praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's continue worshiping him this morning.
Amen. Jesus, we thank you for the truth that we profess this morning. We thank you for the hope that you have given to each and every one of us. Lord, we come into this place and we say all praise belongs to you. All praise belongs to you because you are worthy of it all, God. Thank you for the way that you lead us and thank you for the way that you are guiding us even now. Lord God, we open ourselves up this morning. May your will be done in this place. Lord, by the power of your spirit, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Just a greater glimpse of our Savior and respond. Give him all the worship. We thank you for this time together. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Fishers. I'm Kevin. I'm the lead pastor and it is great to be with you. I feel like between 4th of July and just lots of other stuff happened this summer, I haven't been up here for a while and so it's great to be with you. And I know many of you are traveling and so I want to welcome those who are online and say thanks for joining us and welcome those who are in the room. And if you're a guest or a visitor, just want to say we would love to connect with you and um, you can do that uh, digitally by scanning the uh, connect card in front of you or you can stop by the info center and we, our friends out there would love to meet you as well. Well, as I mentioned, it's summer, and the great thing about summer is there's lots of space and time to do things outside, and so one of the things that we're doing as a church sponsored by our kids and our student ministries is we're doing a pool night next Sunday night at the Forest Park Aquatic Center. We have the whole place. It's $5 for, per kid or student. Adults are free, and so if you've got kids, bring your kids and join us there next Sunday night. Well, every week, uh, communion is available to participate in, but about once a month, we celebrate corporately, and we're going to be doing that this morning. And so I just want to remind you, if you didn't have the opportunity to grab the elements on your way in, uh, if you raise your hand, we should have ushers that are around, or you can get up and grab those elements. We just want to make sure that you're prepared um, for communion, and for those that are online, again, you've got time to grab the elements as well. Well, one of the things that um, many of our Grace Fishers folks have participated in um our short-term mission trips, and we typically send these every year uh, with the exception of a couple of the years of the pandemic. And so I want to invite Keith and Natalie back and their team, and we're going to give you a highlight once you welcome them. Um, they're going to highlight a little bit of uh, what they did on their trip to Guatemala this year, give you a little bit of a glimpse, and encourage you to think about maybe uh, it's time for you to take a short-term mission trip. So don't, don't, don't be strangers. Come forward, guys. Uh, Keith, and Natalie, you guys lead trips all the time. Um, give us a little glimpse into what's happened, uh, what happened in the Guatemala trip. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, first, we'd just like to th say thanks so much for your support and your prayers uh, for the trip. It was absolutely an incredible trip. What we wanted to do this morning was just share some windows and snippets uh, into the mission trip. You guys have seen that filter in the lobby many times, right? And so we wanted to actually walk through what a mission trip looks like. So we would wake up in the morning, we would have a wonderful breakfast at the hotel, then one of our team members would lead a devotional, and then we would grab our backpacks, pack up the filters, and head off into the villages. And from there, the highlight for all of us was the home visits. We would spend at least an hour with the families getting to know them, so we would have time to pet their dogs, eat their tortillas, drink the national drink of Guatemala, you can ask Ryan or the Foley's about that, laugh with them and cry with them. And then after that, they would take us back to the church that we've been serving with, and they would make us sit down and make us a homemade snack. And then we would go back to the hotel and have a homemade meal of chicken, rice, tortillas, and salad. We joke this might be the only mission trip that you gain weight on. And after that, we loved watching the kids, they were aged 18 to 8, that were on the trip from Grace Fishers, play together in the courtyard with a fountain um, with the turtle at night. And we wanted to share some of the highlights from those really powerful home visits. Yeah, so I had the privilege of going with my son, Eli. He was one of the 18 to 8s. He's going to be an 8th grader. And we were in a home, and he played with this young boy named Joshua for that whole hour. And we had the privilege as a team to lead his mom to Christ. And immediately after, she came 
and asked us, asked Joshua to come over. And so Joshua left the, all the kids playing and he came over and she pulled up this shirt and he had scars all over his back and she begged us to pray for him because they were at the end of their medical journey. They, there was nothing more they could do for him. Doctors had told him if they did any more surgeries, he would be paralyzed. And it was just the rest of his life will be the pain that he has in his back. And so we prayed and we prayed. And then as we were leaving, I shared that story with my son because he had been still playing with the rest. And he was immediately broken. And I didn't know if he was going to be able to make it through the rest of the week. He was so broken. But God and his Holy Spirit blessed us the next day, and we got to go back to that same home to install another filter. So he got a whole nother hour with Joshua. And out of that, there was no medical answer, but out of that, Eli made a connection. He prays for Joshua every single day to this day. It's been like two months. And I know if Eli were here, he would ask you to pray for Joshua and his family, that a doctor would show up that could do something, that he would be saved, that he would be at peace. I know those are the things that Eli has learned from the trip. Thanks, Chris. Hi, Bob Foley. Um, one aspect of the, the, the mission is we give them two gifts, the people we visit. We give them a gift of the filter, and we give them the gift of the message of Jesus Christ. And I was really good at the filter part, I don't know about some of you all, but I was pretty intimidated by the message part. Um, and, and we have a nice script and dirty water and clean water. And, and I had all these rationalizations why I didn't want to do it. And as only my wife can do, she called me out saying, well, you're scared. <laughs> well, I, I was a little scared. But so here it is Friday, it's the last day in the afternoon. I'm committed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And I was thinking about this script. And God put us in a place where I was with a man named Marco. He was more my age, and my life experience matched up with some of the things he'd been through and, and the dark parts of my life and his life and prayed over him. And God gave me the words to say. I, I never felt more comfortable. And he accepted Christ in his life. And uh, I know his life has changed, but I know my life has changed after meeting Marco and praying over him. Well, that's a good segue, and actually Ryan's going to share. Ryan, this was your first trip like this. Um, just briefly tell us why somebody here, if they've not been on a trip like this, should consider going next year. Yeah, so this was completely out of my comfort zone. Uh, when the first sign-up came up, I just decided, you know what, I'm signing up, I'm doing this. And then I worried about it until the entire time, <laughs> until we're leaving. But on day two, I got hooked. Um, yeah, to, to Bob's, I was scared to, to share the message. But then on day two, day three, the rest of the time, the first thing in the morning, I was asking, let me be the one that shares. And it's just amazing that you get to bring clean water to kids who are no longer gonna get sick on a regular basis, but then you get to share the gospel and in one house, the mother was already a believer, and she was living with her 17-year-old son and his new wife, who was not a believer. And she had been praying to God to somehow bring someone into their lives that could make a difference in the son. And we prayed. He accepted Christ. So did his bride. And the mother, in tears, tells us, we are the embodiment of her prayers to God to bring someone into their lives. So, yeah, I'm hooked now. This is just going to be part of my life doing trips with uh, the Becks. Well, why don't you thank the team for sharing with us this morning. Thank you all. And Keith, can you get the mic? Well, and I just want to remind you and say thank you for your generosity. When you give to the work of God here at Grace Fishers, you're not only impacting the work that, or the things that happen here on Sunday mornings and throughout the week, but that you're supporting our missionary partners and the work that they do that God has called them to. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Introducing our guest speaker this morning. Her name is Danelle Franklin, and there are so many good things to say about Danelle, I actually had to write them down. But just to get to know her a little bit, Danelle has taught music and worship in Christian higher education for over 44 years, teaching at Dallas Christian College, Ozark Christian College, and Lincoln Christian Seminary. She has a Bachelor of Sacred Music, a Master of Music in Church Music. She holds a Doctor of Worship Studies degree from the Robert Weber Institute for Worship Studies, where she currently serves as a professor and academic dean, meeting twice a year in Jacksonville. Her teaching duties have ranged from musical as well as her current area of worship theology, history, and culture. Danell has also served as a part-time worship minister in several churches, and she's spoken all over the United States for conferences, retreats, and college chapels and she continues to provide workshops and seminars in worship. She has a sister who lives in Salem, Illinois, and a brother who lives in Fishers, Indiana. You may have seen her at Lucas Oil Stadium anytime the Colts have played the Cowboys. She was not rooting for the Colts. <laughs> Don't judge. I try not to. Since her four once-cute nieces and nephews are all grown up, she now actively attempts to win over her 23-month-old grandniece. And what I will say about Danelle is that she is a personal friend and mentor of mine. I studied under her at Lincoln Christian Seminary for my master's in worship studies, and she forever has changed the trajectory of my life, and I'm forever indebted to her just for my appreciation for the theology and philosophy of worship, seeking to uh, just live a life worshiping in spirit and in truth. And even though she's a Cowboys fan, I still love her. So let's give her a big Grace Fisher's welcome, Danelle Franklin. Thank you. I really so appreciate this invitation. And I don't have time to tell you everything I think about Josh. It's all good. Um, but I am privileged that he's my friend and peer and that we've stayed in connection all these years, and you look smart because you hired him. <laughs> I also have to make one quick, dis quick disclaimer. My nieces are here today, and they're still cute. <laughs> I, I, I won't point them out because they don't want to be embarrassed, but I, it, I, they're still cute, even though they're adults, okay? <laughs> well, it would have caused quite a stir on social media at WJR, home of West Bank News, developing story. A man was found beaten half to death on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. Film at 11. Oh, that poor man. I hope he's okay. When are the government authorities gonna do something about that road? We all know that it's dangerous. Yeah, well, it serves him right, don't you think? What was he doing out there on that road by himself? I wonder who found him. Story continues. Still unidentified man found alive 
at the Jericho Roadside Inn. He's talking to authorities. Claims that as he lay in a semi-conscious state, he saw a priest and a Levite pass him by on the other side of the road. Does not remember being rescued. Well, that can't be right. Surely men of God would not just leave someone to die. Well, speaking as one from the priestly order myself, um, if I had stopped to help this man, I would have defiled my own body in such a way that I would be of no service to God. Well, this. And also, it was dangerous. It might have been a trap. They could have been killed themselves. They were right to pass by. Pfft. Of course they didn't stop. That's what's wrong with religion. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. Well, what about the person who found him? Where is he? Exclusive interview with a Jericho innkeeper at 11 o'clock. Look, this guy came by the inn. He had a half-dead man on his own animal. He asked me for a room, and so I gave him one. He took his own clothing and his own oil and wine and helped bind his wounds and heal him. He gave me a boatload of money to take care of the guy. And he even told me that he'd pay more when he came back through. He's been here before. He's always been good for his, uh, his room and his food. That's all I know. Well, isn't it nice to know that there are good people in the world today? I heard that this good person is a Samaritan. Wait, what? That can't be. I hope that innkeeper didn't touch him or his things. I don't think I'll stay there anymore. Dirty, rotten, censored Samaritans. I'd rather die than be rescued by one of them. Well, there was no Twitter, Twitter in first century Judea. And anyway, this isn't a true story. It didn't really happen. It's a story that Jesus is telling to his audience. For us to understand it, it's helpful for us to understand the audience he is talking to. We might consider ourselves an audience some 2,000 plus years later, but we're not the primary audience. A secondary audience would be all the people who have gathered to hear Jesus, and he has developed quite a following in Judea during this time in his ministry. But they were listening in to a conversation Jesus was having with what I believe to be his primary audience, one man, one question, one interaction. And that man is identified in Scripture as an expert in the law or a lawyer. I've known a couple of lawyers. I've never had the need to work with a lawyer. But I have watched hundreds of episodes of Law and Order. <laughs> so I consider myself somewhat of an expert about the law. Now, that law and this law in Scripture are not quite the same because this expert's job is to adjudicate, if you will, the, the, the law of Moses or what we would think of as the Old Testament Scripture. He's an expert in that, and he's supposed to decide whether it's being rightly interpreted or not. But that lawyer, Jack McCoy, the best ADA ever, and this lawyer have one thing in common that is very important. They're both concerned with the letter of the law. What are the parameters which, within which my client is dealing so that I can get him off? Or if you're the prosecutor, the other way around. We have to know what the law is about. So, this man asks a question and he almost certainly already knows the answer, because he's an expert. 
But there's this upstart teacher from Galilee who's causing all this ruckus, and he has an opportunity to ask him a question, maybe trip him up, we don't know. And so he asks a very common question for his day, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, being gracious and kind, says, how did you read the law of Moses? What do you think it means? Well, he knows. It's in his scripture. It's in yours too. (laughs) Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's right. Now think of all the times in Jesus' ministry where he's argued with religious leaders of the law, rebuked them, challenged them, walked away from them. But this one gets it right. Wouldn't you be excited if that was you? This is right, go and do this and you will live. But he can't quite let it go. So he kind of leans toward another question. Scripture says in order to justify himself, which probably means he's trying to figure out if in fact he is living the kind of life that God wants him to live. And so he asks, well then, who is my neighbor. This is a letter of the law question. What are the limits, the boundaries of who it is I'm supposed to love? You might think of it like this. Is my neighbor, are my neighbors those people who live on either side of my house? Or is it my entire neighborhood? Is it my whole subdivision? Or the entire city of Fishers? Does it include all of Hamilton County? The greater Indianapolis area? Is my neighborhood all of the state of Indiana? And what about those renegades that live next door in Illinois? Do I have to love them too? (laughs) Is my neighborhood reaching all the way to the East Coast? Because there are Patriots fans there. Well, it seems silly when you break it down that way, but it's exactly what the lawyer wants to know. You tell me who my neighbor is, I'll love those people, and we're good. Well, Jesus rarely, if ever, directly answers a question. You probably learned that as you've been studying parables this month. And instead, he tells a story. Now, the Jews knew who their neighbors were, but it was a very narrow group of people. So keep that in mind. And I'm going to ask you to assume the identity of not the 21st century audience, but the first century audience, the people who are listening to this story. And I want you to assume this identity as though you're hearing it for the very first time, because we've all heard this so many times and heard things about it, all right? So now you're in the first century, and you're about to hear this story that Jesus is telling. I'm gonna spot you two important pieces of information that you'd know. First of all, it has to do with the road from Jericho, Jericho, Jerusalem to Jericho, right? It's about 18 miles. It's very much downhill. Jerusalem is on the ridge of a mountain and Jericho is on the plain of the Jordan River. It's an elevation of nearly half a mile by the time you go from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho. It's desert, it's rocky, it's craggy. There are lots of caves to hide in. It was a very popular place for thieves to prey on people who were alone and steal from them. And then they could run away and hide and not be caught. That's one thing that you know. Here's a second thing you know. Well, you're Jews, and I'm sorry, but you hate Samaritans. And to be fair, Samaritans hate you too. The animosity between those two groups is clear throughout history and throughout Scripture. John talks about it in his gospel. And just the chapter before this one in Luke, a whole town of Samaritans have run Jesus and his disciples out of town. The disciples 
in response, wanted to call fire down from heaven and burn them up. But if you've watched The Chosen at all, you know that's not the way Jesus works. It's not going to do that. He rebukes his disciples, and they leave town. But here they are. So here's the story. That's all you know. All right? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is a nameless, faceless man. We don't know his name. We don't know anything about him. He's assigned no race, no ethnicity. We don't know if he's skinny or burly or tall or short or rich or poor, what his occupation is, whether he has a family, what he's doing on the road. He's just a man. And he falls among thieves. What do you know? Very common. You're not surprised at all. Of course he did, because that happens all the time. And he stripped and left half dead. And then, Jesus says, a priest happens to be walking by and walks by on the other side. You know what? You don't know anything about this priest either. You know that priests often worked in Jerusalem and lived in Jericho. Maybe you're not surprised that he's on the road. But this priest is assigned no values, no morals, no motives. He just walks by. You know that he's a very important servant in the temple. And so he's followed by a lesser important ser servant, but still an important one, a Levite, still no morals, no values, no motives, and he just walks by. But you're listening to the story, and you think you know what's coming next. Because Jesus is using an ancient storytelling technique. You know it. Three bears, three pigs, three ghosts of Christmas, <clears throat> a scarecrow, a tin man, and a lion. Somebody else is coming down the road. And it's going to be a Jew. And he's going to be a lesser Jew than the priest or the Levite, but that's okay. They kind of, been, they kind of bother us sometimes anyway. Win one for the little guy. Here we go. And then the learned teacher says, a Samaritan saw him. What did he say? Um, Martha, did he say Samaritan? I think my hearing aids are broken. I suspect there was great murmuring among the crowd. Surely not. Jesus was about to make a Samaritan into the hero of this story. He says, the Samaritan had pity on the man, which is a deep emotion from the very depths of a person's soul. Eugene Peterson translates it, his heart went out to him. This is the kind of pity that is motivated by the hurt of another, and it's the kind of pity that leads to action, not just emotion. Every single action of this Samaritan was extravagant. He put the man on his own beast, which meant he would have had to walk the rest of the way. He used his own clothing. He used expensive oil and wine to help heal his wounds. He gave the innkeeper what amounted to two days' wages in the time of Jesus and then left his credit card, so to speak, in case he needed anything else. He gave from the depths of his own soul and did not think at all about himself. This seems like the end of the story, doesn't it? The guy gets rescued. I learned a song about this when I was in vacation Bible school back in the, you know, when they had flannel graphs. Anybody remember? <laughs> right. It went like this. Who is my neighbor? The man next door. The people across the street and many more. Every child of God on this whole wide earth, in this earth, in the sight of God, is of excellent worth. The story I was taught means that God loves everybody, everybody is my neighbor, so I should love everybody. This is a good lesson. 
But Jesus didn't ask the guy, well then, according to my story, who is your neighbor? He said, according to the story, which one was the neighbor? See, my Jewish audience, <laughs> you would have preferred my first version of the story where the Jew is the rescuer because that keeps you in your own neighborhood, so to speak. You can love your enemy, which Jesus had taught, and even rescue a Samaritan, quite possibly. But it is one thing for me to love my enemy and quite another for the enemy to love me. The audience is hearing that this Samaritan, this person that they hate, actually fulfill the law of Moses, which stated that you should be hospitable to all, especially strangers, and that trumps anything else. He is the one who showed compassion. He is the one who gave all of himself. Not my Jewish neighbors, but this hated enemy. And that's a much bigger world than they were expecting to hear about. Well, now the lawyer has a chance to shine. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Depends on how you look at it. Maybe. Maybe he was so put off by the idea that he couldn't utter the name Samaritan in answer to the question. But, you know he had the answer to this in his back pocket too? The prophet Micah had asked a similar question. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? So maybe, maybe this lawyer is beginning to grasp the reality of the story of Jesus. Not just this parable, but the story of Jesus himself, his life, his ministry, why he came to this earth. This story that you and I celebrate every Sunday when we gather together. And so he answered the one who showed mercy. This word mercy is used one other time in this way in the Gospel of Luke. It's the first chapter. Zechariah is singing a song about his son, John the Baptist, and the future coming of the Messiah. And he's talking about this salvific act as God's tender mercy. God's mercy for us. It's related to an Old Testament word, hesed, which is the mercy of our covenant God. It's the mercy that God shows to us even though we can't do anything about it ourselves and even though we don't deserve it. And these Jewish people and this learned man of the law who know all about hesed and have learned about it in their scripture and have been brought up as part of their heritage are now standing in the presence of personified mercy. So maybe, maybe Jesus isn't answering a question as much as he's questioning an answer. The answer that the lawyer wants is something about the letter of the law. The answer that Jesus gives is about the fulfillment of the law, which sort of reframes the question. Maybe the question is not, who is your neighbor? The question is, who are you? Jesus has just told his disciples earlier to love others and show mercy to others as their Father has shown mercy. So would you be back 21st century audience now? Of all of the characters in this story, which one looks the most like Jesus? You see, the limitedness of our human parameters, the world in which we live and show kindness, pales in comparison 
to the vastness of God's mercy. Justice and mercy have no neighborhood boundaries. They are not limited to race or ethnicity or social class or economic status or any of the things that we tend to look at in 21st century America as being important. They don't ask questions like, is that person like me? They ask questions like, what does that person need? They don't just see need, they see value. They might even be willing to reach across the aisle and accept mercy from someone that I don't even like or care for. Jesus doesn't stop his conversation with the lawyer here. So if the question isn't, who is my neighbor? What is it that Jesus is trying to get this guy to do? Pretty clear, go. Go and do likewise. Go be like the Samaritan. When Jesus says go, he means business. To the rich young ruler who asked the exact same question, go and sell all your possessions. To the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. To his disciples, go into all the world and preach. The real lesson here is that, yeah, everybody's your neighbor, but that doesn't matter if you don't do mercy if you don't do something about it, if you're not willing to go beyond what you know and what you see and what you understand and go out there in the world and look for those who need mercy and do it, not just say it. I don't know you well enough to know what doing mercy looks like for this congregation. But I think this definition helps Mercy is attending to the sorrows that are plain before us. Somebody in your life needs mercy. Somebody at your job, somebody at your school, somebody on your commute, somebody at Starbucks needs mercy that you have to give. And if you want to give it, you have to be like the Samaritan who stepped across prejudice and boundaries and fear and anger to say, I see a need and I will meet it in the name of Jesus Christ. I know a lot of churches today that are looking to be more than just a building. They're looking to grow not just in numbers, but in transformational work of Jesus Christ. I think this church may be one of those. I don't know how to tell you to do that, but I have a good idea that if you want to be the church that people look at and say, oh, I would like to be a part of that. Oh, I want to know what's going on there. Oh, what is it that is different about those people? Then this is all I know to tell you to do in your neighborhood. Do justice. Love mercy and don't walk by on the other side. Well, I'm not going to say a whole lot other than we have an opportunity to really just take in what we've just heard as we prepare our hearts for communion. And we, we think about many things during communion. We think of Jesus. We think of this gift that he's given to us. And also his unparalleled mercy, where he reached down to us in our helpless state to lift us up. 
And so we're going to have some music playing. And I just want to encourage everyone, all of us here, to take a moment to reflect, to pray, to be still, and just consider the mercy that has been poured out to each and every one of us and what we're going to do about it in our lives. Let's celebrate communion together. You may take the bread and the juice when you're ready. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean, singing high. My sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary, where he suffered and died alone. Yes, he did. We're singing.
the ransomed in glory his face i at last shall see twill be my joy Friends, would you join me in prayer as we close our time together? Father God, we thank you for this beautiful reminder of the mercy that you have demonstrated for each one of us, that you have shown us mercy when we most needed it. Thank you for the life of Jesus and the way that he gives us new life. And Father, I just pray that we would simply carry Danelle's final challenge with us into this week, that we would go and do likewise. And I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to those in front of us who need mercy. Father God, I just pray that your spirit would guide us each step of the way this week. We just thank you for the opportunity to gather and to celebrate your goodness to us this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, uh, it's been great.